Welcome to the Scaringi Law Lunch Break. This is your time of the day to learn a little bit about the law while you enjoy your lunch. With the holiday season right around the corner, many Pennsylvanians will be celebrating the spirit of the season with a few spirits themselves. Regrettably, many will get behind the wheel after a little too much celebrating. DUI arrests are highest around the holidays, so let's prepare for the worst, shall we, and imagine that the worst has happened. You've been charged with DUI, and you've received a criminal complaint in the mail. So what does this complaint mean? Well, many people ask us uh, similar questions every time they get a DUI complaint in the mail. Why have I been charged with two counts of DUI when I was only pulled over once? Am I being charged twice? What does that mean for me? Why are two counts of DUI on the criminal complaint? Well, the answer to this question has to deal with Pennsylvania grades, with how Pennsylvania grades DUI offenses. Most people have the general knowledge that it is illegal to drive when your blood alcohol concentration, aka BAC, is at or above 0.08%. However, this is only part of the picture. In fact, this common knowledge can be misleading in a way. Many people don't know that you can be convicted for DUI even if the police don't know what your BAC was at the time you were driving. In Pennsylvania, the DUI laws are found within Chapter 38 of the Pennsylvania Motor Vehicle Code. The offense itself is located at Title 75, PA Consolidated Annotated Statute 3802. That's the big DUI statute a section here in Pennsylvania. And Title 75 is just known collectively as the Pennsylvania Motor Vehicle Code. This is the portion of the law that contains all of Pennsylvania's vehicle code provisions. And as an aside, yes, DUI is a crime. Uh, we have, uh, over the years, many individuals who come in here charged with DUI, uh, and they'll try to explain to us that it's not a crime. Uh, but uh, regrettably, it is. Uh, Section 302 of the Motor Vehicle Code describes the violation of driving under the influence of alcohol or a controlled substance. Now, it's broken down into three primary tiers, with Tier 1 being the lowest and Tier 3 being the highest or the most severe offense in terms of consequences. The first tier, Tier 1, it states that an individual may not drive, operate, or be in actual physical control of the movement of a motor vehicle after imbibing a sufficient amount of alcohol such that the individual is incapable of safely driving, operating, or being in actual physical control of the movement of the vehicle. Now that's Title 75, Section 3802A1. And interestingly, you'll notice in the main DUI statute, you don't see the words driving under the influence. That was the old language. Years ago, the DUI law was amended, and it's now driving after imbibing. Uh, it's actually DAI, but no one, no one refers to it as DUI, DAI. They always refer to it and only refer to it as DUI, so DUI remains, even though technically it's not really DUI. All right. Anyway, right off the bat, do you notice the glaring omission from this law? Sorry, I got a sidetrack now. But anyway, that 3802A1, nowhere does it reference blood alcohol content. Nowhere does it reference the BAC. So most people don't know this fact, but a straight reading of the law says that you can be convicted of DUI if the Commonwealth can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that you had any amount of alcohol in your system and that you were driving a vehicle and that were operating a motor vehicle, uh, not, not technically driving, just operating a motor vehicle, and the alcohol in your system, regardless of the BAC, rendered you incapable of driving or operating a motor vehicle safely. So that's the, that's 3802A1. The police do not need your BAC. All they need is evidence that you are driving after imbibing and that driving after imbibing the alcohol rendered you incapable of safely operating the motor vehicle. No BAC is necessary in order to be convicted 
of that DUI offense. Now, Tier 1 also includes a provision that begins exactly the same as the above that I just read, with one difference. It states an individual may not drive, operate, or be in actual physical control of the movement of a motor vehicle after imbibing a sufficient amount of alcohol such that the alcohol concentration in the individual's blood is at least 0.08%, but less than 0.1% within two hours after the individual has driven, operated, or been in actual physical control of the movement of the motor vehicle. That's 380282. Uh, and that is where you have the first reference to BAC. And that's the difference. If, if, do you see the difference between the, between the two provisions? Yes. The second provision includes the commonly referenced BAC of 0.08%. Uh, however, unlike the first part, it doesn't say anything about whether the individual is incapable of driving safely. See, if you are driving and your BAC is above 0.08%, you have broken the law and can be convicted uh, as such, even if you were driving perfectly. Uh, in short, the police can get you two ways. One, if your BAC is above the legal limit, uh, you can be guilty of DUI even if you were capable of driving safely. And two, if there is any alcohol in your system and the alcohol rendered you incapable of driving safely, you too can be convicted. And for that second type of DUI offense, the police do not need your BAC. Now, this is what people are seeing in the criminal complaint that confuses them. When you're charged with DUI, the police charge you with every possible provision for which you could be in violation. If you later plead guilty or are convicted of DUI, the two provisions will merge for the purposes of sentencing, and you will only be convicted of one DUI offense. Once you understand this distinction, the remaining tiers are much easier to understand. Tier 1 is for individuals whose BAC is 0.08 to 0.099. Tier 2 is reserved for those individuals whose BAC is at least 0.1%, but less than 0.16%. Similarly, a Tier 3 violation indicates those who have a BAC of 0.16% or greater, or they have a controlled substance in their blood. So, am I being charged twice for the same DUI? Well, the answer to that question is kind of. When filing criminal charges, the police will always charge an individual with the most serious offense for which he could be convicted, as I've explained, and every lesser included offense. For example, if an individual had a BAC of 0.23%, this would put him in the highest tier, tier three, and an officer will charge him as such. You'll, you'll get a tier three charge. However, the officer will also charge the individual with the lowest tier, tier one offense, in case the blood results are inadmissible in court. So if the tier three offense doesn't prevail and the police no longer have a BAC or your BAC is suppressed, and it's not able to be permitted as evidence against you in court, they still can convict you of the Tier 1 offense because, remember, a BAC is not necessary for the Tier 1 offense. Uh, now, if the individual, uh, in the, for the general impairment offense, uh, in, the, in the alternative, if an individual is convicted of a Tier 3 DUI, the lesser offense will merge and it will only reflect that this person has been convicted of one DU offense. So you can get two charges and then ultimately if you're convicted, uh, those two charges will merge for the purposes of sentencing. Regrettably, you'll get the more severe sentence, but two charges, one conviction, one sentence. Why does any of this matter? Well, the answer is simple. The higher the tier, the more serious the penalty. For a first offense DUI, the penalty uh, in Tier 1 is six months of probation, a $300 fine, and no license suspension. The same DUI under a Tier 3 violation carries a penalty of three days in jail, followed by six months of parole, and a fine of $1,000 to $5,000 and a 12-month driver's license suspension. This disparity in sentencing becomes even greater when dealing with second, third, or subsequent DUIs. Now, the conclusion, in short, while the concept of DUI laws can be simple to understand, there is clearly a lot of nuance that can have a great effect on your case.
In any case, when facing a DUI, you shouldn't deal with it alone. It's important to have someone working for you uh, who can explain every step of the process to you and what it means. Uh, the only way someone can make the best decision for him or herself is by making that decision fully informed. If you're charged with DUI or have any questions or concerns about DUI law in Pennsylvania, please do not hesitate to contact one of Scaringi Law's seasoned DUI attorneys at 717-657-7770 or check out our website at scaringilaw.com. Well, that's about all the time we have today for the Scaringi Law, uh, Law Lunch Break. I hope you learned a little bit about the law. Thanks for listening, and enjoy your lunch.